Good evening. I'm a garbologist and I love to talk trash. Actually, I love trash so much, I just brought some with me this evening for company. Thank you. I know what you're thinking. Garbologist, is that even a real word? Yes, it is. It exists just like the word garbology. What do people like me do? We study garbage. Think of us as a cross between anthropologists and archaeologists. We study garbage to see what human society and culture are producing. We do studies. We do waste analyses, and we call these waste characterizations. Now, where do we do these? We do these in small institutions, large institutions, universities, small businesses, and homes. We also do dumpster diving, which is a very fun activity. <laughs> Although, when you have short legs, getting out of the dumpster is a little <laughs> difficult. But our most important type of study is our landfill study. Those are very similar to what climate scientists do when they study past climate. We drop metal tubes into the landfills and we bring them up. And then we analyze the cores that we take out to see what human consumption over time is like. Unlike the cores that the climate scientists take out, which can be about six inches in diameter, ours can be as much as five feet across. There's a lot of garbage in there. But this is the application of garbology in life today. It tells us what people consume, what we've been consuming in the past, and what we are seeing in terms of consumption patterns. Before I tell you a little bit about garbage, let me tell you about the picture. This is me at the landfill in front of one of the machines that is used to compress the waste. Note the studs on the wheels. Those apply thousands of pounds of pressure on the waste to make sure that it's nicely compacted in the landfill. Every time I go, I ask them to let me drive it, but they keep using this word, liability. <laughs> <laughs> so what is garbage? Garbage is a completely human construct. Garbage doesn't occur in nature. There is no waste in nature. Everything in nature is recycled and reused. Yet here we are, the most intelligent and sentient being to ever roam the planet, and we generate vast quantities of waste, most of which we do not reuse or recycle. We send it to the landfill. But we don't stop there. There is waste in orbit several hundred miles above us, moving at 17,000 miles per hour. But it doesn't stop there. We've been to the moon, we've been to Mars, where we have also left waste behind us. Now, science and space exploration are wonderful, but the fact that we leave waste everywhere we go is something that's not very good. Now, all of this waste that we produce, what do our waste character characterizations tell us? That levels of affluenza are skyrocketing. Affluenza, made up of the words affluence and influenza, tell us our consumption. I like to refer to it as our over-addiction to consumption, the constant, the insatiable need for more stuff. There is never enough. We continue getting more and more. How do we quantify the affluenza? In terms of how much waste we produce every day. Now, in 1960, the average American produced about 2.7 pounds every single day. Today, we produce 5 pounds, almost double. For comparison, an average European produces about three pounds. Now, all of this consumption clearly leads to the production of more waste. And what that leads us to is something called the ecological footprint. This is our impact on the planet. This is a measure of how many goods are produced by what it is that we need in our lives. Now, how do we calculate the ecological footprint? We calculate it by the number of planets. We, the citizens of developed countries, have an ecological footprint between five and six. This means that if everybody in the world lived a life like we do, it would require five to six planets. Clearly, we've only got one planet, so the equation doesn't quite balance. 
Now, contrary to this, somebody in the developed world, developing world has an ecological footprint of only one planet or even less. Therefore, our levels of affluenza, our generation of waste is having an impact on the planet. Ideally, we need to decrease these values because every hour there are 10,000 new more people on the planet, all of whom are looking towards us in the developed countries as having this kind of lifestyle. Again, we've got only one planet. And I know that while Matt Damon made Mars look a wonderful place to live and having it be a wonderful adventure, it's not quite as romantic. Why is there so much of garbage? The garbage is produced because of the economic system that we live in. Our current global economic system is based on the acquisition of profit, short-term profit. We need to generate profit and we need to generate profit very quickly. How do we do that? By continuing to have the goods moved, having more goods, having more goods, and that means having more garbage and having more garbage. That is why I'm able to go to the landfill to dig the garbage up. However, this has an impact on the planet. Again, we've got only one planet and we've only got so many resources. The problem is that the way we manufacture goods today is employing a system called plant obsolescence. The goods don't last anymore. I think many of us can identify with it. We buy it and soon it breaks. Ideally, what needs to happen is that we change the way we manufacture our goods so goods last longer. They're not thrown away and they don't end up in the landfill. What do we do with all of this waste once it's been generated? There are three main ways of dealing with it. Landfilling it. We dig a hole in the ground, we pack the waste in it, then we bring the wonderful machines to pack it in there. Many of us think that when we go to the supermarket and we choose paper over plastic, the paper will go into the landfill and it will biodegrade. I hate to tell you that is not the case. We did landfill studies in the 1990s. We dug up mail, we dug up phone books that were completely legible. We even dug up some 10-year-old hot dogs that still actually looked like hot dogs. <laughs> this goes to show that there really isn't that much biodegradation in the landfills. And in addition to this, because we don't have oxygen in there because the waste is compacted, we produce methane, which is a very important greenhouse gas. Now, the second way of dealing with waste is incineration, where we burn it to decrease the volume. And we can decrease the volume by almost two-thirds, which is a good thing. However, the problem with incineration from the ecological point of view is that once you burn that waste, you reduce it to ash. It can never be reused. If it's in the landfill, at least we can go back and get it, but from the incineration, we cannot get it. Now, many current incinerators are actually referred to as waste to energy plants or energy recovery plants. This means that when we burn the waste, we use the heat generated to turn water into steam to produce electricity. Therefore, the waste at least gets some sort of a life before it is laid to rest forever. Now, the last way of dealing with the waste is recycling, which is clearly the preferred way, but not the one that is practiced the most. I think everybody is familiar with the chasing arrows up there, the quintessential sign of recycling, which appears in a lot of our plastics. Recycling is actually very complicated. When people ask me, is something recyclable? My answer is always, it depends. Now, what does it depend on? It depends on the market. If there is somebody out there who's going to take that material and make something new out of it, it will be recycled. It will be sent to a place where new product will be made. If there is no market, it will end in the landfill. This applies to paper and cardboard and plastic and everything else. Now, for us in South Florida, in terms of plastic, I think everybody knows at the bottom of our bottles, we have our chasing arrows with numbers. We here only recycle those that have numbers one through six in them. Everything else ends up in the landfill or in the incinerator. So again, because the market is so narrow, very few goods end up being recycled. So what can we do to change things? We need to have not only changes at the very top, but we certainly need to have also changes at the bottom. Starting at the very top, the market needs to look at the way goods are produced. We need to move away from the planned obsolescence and we need to move to something called cradle to cradle, 
which is basically changing the way we produce things, that everything that is produced is ultimately recyclable. Nothing will go to the landfill. New goods will be made from the old goods when they break or when they become obsolete, new goods will become of them. We need help, obviously, from our legislators and the lawmakers to have this occur. At the community level, we need to make sure that we work with our schools, with our shops, with our restaurants, that we do not provide them with goods and plastics that are not recyclable. We need to make sure that everything that we use ends up being recycled somewhere. And last but not the least, on the individual level, we need to be educated about what can be recycled and what cannot. One of the things we need to be sure that we do not do is something called waste cycling. Waste cycling is when we put stuff into the recycling bins that doesn't quite belong. Things like what we have our lunch in and flip-flops and hangers. It's all plastic and we put it in there because we think, we hope it's going to be recycled. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. The problem is when we put contamination into the recycling bin, if there is too much recycling, that can render entire loads contaminated and unrecyclable, and they do end up in the landfill. So what we need to do, and as much as I love recycling and don't want to tell you not to recycle, the six words to live by are, when in doubt, throw it out. So what do we need to do? We need to think about our ecological footprint. We need to decrease the affluenza. We need to know what the impact on the planet is. We need to stop. We need to do better. We really need to make a difference. And even the little bit that every one of us makes can add up if everybody does it. That's why we should continue doing it. We need to do the right thing. So please join me in doing the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Thank you.